right, I'm here with Arnold Donald, CEO of Carnival Corporation. Uh, Arnold, thanks for taking some time. Appreciate it. Good to be with you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, it's been a busy time uh, for Carnival, to, <laughs> to, to, to say the very least. But what has it been like managing through the situation? Um, look, this is unprecedented. Um, this is a global pandemic. The entire world is engaged in it. Um, we've completely paused our guest operations. Um, you know, we've been fighting for the survival of the company. Um, so it's an unprecedented time. And uh, so it's been um, interesting, to say the least, challenging, to say the least. But at the same time, in some ways, it's been um, energizing and invigorating to see our people rise up and deal with the many, many challenges that we've had to deal with. And it's been encouraging to see the world rise up. And we stand with everyone um, in, in seeking to mitigate you know, the spread of this virus and doing what we can do together to ensure that, that we achieve that. You know, we've, been, we've been covering this situation very closely here at Yahoo Finance. And, and for the past month or two, look, we've been covering uh, infections and, and fatalities and all eyes have been on carnivals uh, the Diamond Princess and the Grand Princess. What's the status of these two ships right now? In many cases, we've talked to passengers on these ships. We've talked to them after. We've been closely following them. Where are they now? Well, of course, our, our entire fleet has paused um, in operations. Physically, uh, the Grand Princess or the Diamond Princess is still over in Asia. Uh, the Grand Princess is somewhere here in the Western Hemisphere. Um, but but the ships, um, we still have a lot of crew on board our ships because it's been difficult to repatriate crew back to their homes um, because of travel restrictions around the world. In some cases, borders are closed. So we still have 50 something thousand crew across our, our 100 plus ships uh, that we're trying to repatriate you know, back home. Um, but the bottom line is um, you know, we are preparing now to manage through this pause and to be ready once the medical community and the scientific community has aligned around you know, what are the best protocols to have in place to mitigate spread of um, COVID-19 and uh, to manage whatever level of risk society is, is willing to take as people socially gather. So it's not about crews, it's about when will society be ready for people to socially gather again, whether that's um, you know in restaurants and uh, land resorts, crews, airport terminals, subway, whatever it is, when, when will the society be ready for that? And then what are the protocols that will have been aligned around as the most effective ones uh, to minimize the risk and mitigate spread. Arnold, these two, the, the two, chip, the two ships in question, the Diamond Princess and the Grand Princess, what are your longer term plans for them? Will they return to service? Um, those ships will certainly return to service. Um, uh, Diamond Princess, in many ways in Japan, is actually looked at as the, uh, uh, in Japan, a lot of the coverage was, well, for the guests on that ship for these um, systems uh, and how well they were treated, both from a commercial standpoint in terms of how we, we handled them, but also from a treatment uh, on the ship itself. Uh, they saw the ship as helping to contain um, the spread of the virus. You have to keep in mind that no ship has a virus. It, it comes when people come on and it, it came from on these ships from community spread is where it origi originated. Uh, and then the degree of spread on the ship is still, even with the Diamond Princess, is still something that's um, an ongoing debate um, amongst the medical professionals. Uh, but our policy is always the same. We will comply with the Diamond Princess. We did exactly what the Japanese Ministry of Health instructed us to do. Uh, we allowed them to quarantine the ship, which is what you know they, they wanted to do. And so that wasn't a cruise those last few weeks. That was a quarantine ship. Uh, so anyway, so so those ships will come back in and do course. Uh, I think the Diamond Princess will have a nice reception in Japan, which is the home market for that ship. And the Grand Princess, when she comes back, I'm sure she'll have a nice reception in the market. You know, Arlo, what you mentioned procedures. What type of new procedures are you going to put in uh, once the ships do go back into service? New cleaning procedures, new operating procedures. What have you learned? You know, Brian, um, you, you know this well from covering the industry a bit, but, you know, the cruise industry has always had really high standards of protocols around health. Uh, we sailed to seven continents. I have 105 ships, um, nine, you know, uh, different brands, and we sail everywhere in the world every year. So every year we have to deal with disease and virus, bacteria, health issues, uh, whether it's Ebola, 
uh, SARS, MERS, Zika, measles, norovirus, chickenpox, you know, whatever it is. So many cruise ships, the most cruise ships, almost the entire industry, has really high standards. We have things that most public venues where there are social gatherings do not have. We have medical screening. We have temperature scanning. We have um, hand sanitizer becoming more popular now throughout the ship. Signage about washing hands everywhere. We have medical facilities on board. So typically the standards have been even higher with regards uh, to health um, kind of uh, preventative measures and, and treatment measures on board a ship than you'll find in, in many land-based um, venues. Uh, having said that, of course, this is a new thing. And the epidemiology is still being determined. People still aren't quite clear. Uh, but I think in several weeks now, with all the data flowing around the world, that the medical professionals and scientists will align around which protocols are the most effective to mitigate the spread and, and minimize the risk. Whatever those are will be the ones we will employ. And uh, whichever ones that wherever we go, because everywhere we go, there are standards. And wherever we go, whichever destination we go to, whatever the standards are in that destination, we have to meet them. So it's premature to say exactly what that will be because the world is still deciding on testing even. You know, some say testing is a benefit, some say it's not. Um, temperature scans, some people say temperature scanning is helpful, some say it's not. But soon the world will align around that, and whatever the world decides is what we will comply with. And, again, obviously we'll take our learnings to see if we can go beyond that. No, uh, no surprise here. There have been several lawsuits that have started to crop up from the people on these ships that were, that were impacted. From a carnival perspective, do you plan to establish a relief fund for families impacted by what happened on the, on the, on the Grand Princess and Diamond Princess? Uh, not so much just for those um, ships, but in general, you know, we have a, um, a philanthropic arm and, and we have been generous in the past with regards to natural disasters everywhere in the world and, and other crises that have popped up. And, and I'm sure our philanthropic arm will be looking at what can we do in the context of all of, of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to get into too much debate around this, but the bottom line is um, community spread is what causes, you know, the COVID. Um, and the cruise ships are, you know, we're a big city at sea. Whatever happens in a city, this will happen on a cruise ship. And so from there, we, we have to look at it from, from that vantage point and, and move forward. You know, you mentioned that you have been uh, fighting for your survival. Uh, Carnival, Carnival has been fighting for its survival. You've raised... Uh, I believe over six billion dollars in liquidity. Uh, are you still looking for liquidity? And the money you've raised, how long a timeline does that give you in terms of a recovery? You know, the responsible thing as a CEO in this situation, when you have, you know, pause your operations, you pause your business for a period of time for all practical purposes, you have no revenue. Is you know, we have to collectively, um, as a board and, and as management, ensure that we're able to withstand a long pause not knowing how long the pause would be. Now, hopefully, you know, we're overcompensating and we won't need to be as prepared as we're trying to be prepared. But yes, we raised a net $6.4 billion uh, recently in the markets and senior debt and convertibles and uh, public debt, you know, equity. Uh, and then we um, also uh, have drawn down our revolver. Uh, so that was another $3 billion. And we continue to seek additional liquidity, whether it's you know, delaying, you know, debt maturities, uh, whether it's participating in stimulus packages around the world uh, where it's appropriate for us to participate in them, et cetera. And, of course, managing. So we, we have to manage our business to the current situation, which is a temporary pause in our guest operations. So, um, you know, reducing our costs, conserving our cash, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's the smart thing to do. Um, right now, we feel confident we could go through the year. We hope we don't have to, but we could go through our fiscal year, uh, and we're trying to push beyond that, of course, and, and think there's a possibility that we could go even that much longer with, with zero revenues coming in and, and still be able to um, have a company at the end of it. But, but we'll have to see. Are you planning to raise more capital? Um, at this point in time, again, um, we're seeking additional liquidity through um, – things available to us, whether stimulus packages or um, other debt that normally would be available to us. But we have not have any immediate plans to go back into a public uh, you know, offering at this point. 
Uh, the Saudi Arabia Wealth Fund took a, an 8.2 stake uh, in Carnival, uh, part of that those, those capital raising efforts. Um, were there other options? or And I'm very curious on why he went that route. No, look, we just did a, a public offering, and uh, they chose to invest. We're happy to have them as investors. Um, you know, they had a stake already, and they plus their stake up a bit um, with the offering. Uh, but we didn't make a particular selective pitch to any one investor. We we just opened it up to the broad investment community, and, and they chose to invest, and we're happy to have them. Have they expressed any interest in investing more? Uh, we haven't had any um, extended, you know, discussions with individual investors like that. But I hope they and everyone would be interested in, um, in investing more in us over time. Help help investors understand this. Do you have to wait? Uh, so the CDC has a no sale uh, order, which might extend till, by my math, July twenty fourth. Do you have to wait for them to, to green stamp uh, and give it a give it a go that sailing could happen again? Um, the CDC, of course, regulates um, U.S. sailings and um, uh, and potentially um, others follow the CDC, but there are other um, health authorities around the world that people follow. Um, so the CDC mandate, yes, uh, the no sale order um, was the earliest of three things, one of which is the 100 day date that, that you mentioned, which I think you're right, is July 24th. Um, so, yes, we would be in compliance with whatever the, the you know, our authorities are. CDC, I'm sure, could issue a new um, statement at any time, including shortening this one if they thought it was in the best interest of public health. And, um, and we just stand with everyone in every place we go um, that we want to be in compliance with regards to whatever the public health standards are you know, for that particular destination, and the U.S. is one of those. Do you anticipate that you will be sailing again before you're in? Um, again, I would never try to put a timeline on it. We're preparing for the worst, but of course, hoping for something much better. And I think what will determine that, it's not about crews. It's about social gathering and society's willingness to have people socially gather. If people are socially gathering, that's a condition necessary for crews because that's what crews is. And, um, and if that happens, then within the protocols that are defined in the various destinations we go to with uh, any supplemental things that we think we can come up with to further enhance the guest experience and and, uh, and de-risk um, any, any health um, possible complications, uh, we'll, we'll do it. So could it happen before the end of the year? Absolutely. Will it happen? I don't know. Um, are we hoping that would happen? Absolutely. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there, including a lot of our previous cruise goers, that are anxiously awaiting for the green light because they want to cruise. You know, people are still booking, especially for 21, but even for 2020. And um, as soon as we're able to cruise, I know there's a lot of people that, that are anxious to cruise with us because, as you know, Brian, cruise is the best vacation experience and the best vacation value there is. On that, to that end, Arnold, uh, the bookings for to early 2021, how are they looking? 20, 2021 is looking good. I mean, we, we, we are continuing to get bookings there. There are a lot of people who have cruised for many years and have confidence and, and they, they're anxious for a cruise. And so... So they, they are looking good there, you know, and, and that's about all I can say because we're between quarters and stuff. But but the bottom line is, yeah, 2021, we are getting bookings and they're good. Uh, the big question here is, uh, were you were you surprised that you didn't have, that there was no relief for the cruise industry uh, from the government? And, and I get it. Uh, the cruise line historically has not been domiciled uh, in the U.S., but you guys employ a lot of people and a lot of folks in the U.S., not just the, the cruise industry. It's also the supply chain. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, we have 150,000 employees overall, uh, many of them here in the U.S., but, but one job on a cruise ship is maybe four to seven other jobs in the economy. We're a huge economic multiplier. So, first of all, I think it's most important that the people who are dependent on cruise are taken care of in this crisis, and that includes you know, travel agents. We have a lot of travel agent professionals. This is their livelihood. Many of them focus or concentrate on cruise. Uh, so those people, you know, when we're not cruising, it really hurts them. We've done some things to, to help them in terms of honoring commissions, even on canceled cruises and so on, to try to help them. Um, we also have a host of other people from, you know, little tour guide folks who run dog sled tours in Alaska to you know, Uber drivers and taxi drivers, baggage handlers, um, restaurant owners. Uh, airlines, um, hotel owners, when people spend a night before getting on a cruise. So it's a huge economic driver. And all of those people have been impacted. The workers in the restaurants, everybody's been impacted. 
and and it's important and i'm I'm happy that there has been stimulus money trying to support many of those small businesses and those individuals for us as a company we've been devastating with other um, companies in travel and tourism uh, it's been devastating for us and so it would have been nice uh, we never asked for an infusion of cash or anything but it would have been nice to have had some form of support whether it was in guarantees of loans or whatever but that didn't happen here in the u.s and so um, you know, we went out and, and did our own non-governmental type um, financing and were able to secure enough uh, to give us a runway. Are you, just given how things sh- uh, shook out here, are you open to being domiciled in the U.S. and then in the hopes of getting some government relief? You know, we're a global company. Uh, we were incorporated in Panama. Um, you know, more than half our um, income comes from outside the U.S. We're dual listed. We're listed in the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. We're a truly global company. Um, you never say never about anything, but we wouldn't consider re, um, uh, changing domicile to participate in a stimulus package. I mean, that, you know, we wouldn't do that. Um, so uh, for us, you know, we pay you know hundreds of million dollars a year in taxes in the U.S., uh, not in the traditional form of income tax, which a, a number of people point out. But but the reality is, it's an alternative tax regimen for the maritime industry, which has existed for a long time because the ships move about around the world. And we do pay U.S. taxes. It's just not in the, the conventional form that other companies pay. Having said that, look, we, we're happy to be in the U.S. We are happy to sell U.S. guests. We love working with our U.S. partners, whether it's travel professionals, tour operators, with, um, you know, everyone that's involved in the cruise industry. And uh, we look forward to sailing again soon. Uh, in terms of years, how many years has the industry been set back by this situation? We've talked in the past on how cruise ships have, they finally started to attract millennials. But do you think millennials will want to get back on these ships? I think everybody's going to get back on the ships. Um, and, and millennials over-indexed on cruising uh, prior to this happening. I'm sure they'll be back again once we start sailing again. Um, you know, people want to describe it kind of as a cruise thing. This is not a cruise issue. You know, this is a societal issue, as is evidenced by the fact people are staying home, you know, shelter in place, et cetera. Um, when society is ready to socially gather and society feels that socially gathering um, does not have undue risk, health risk, then we will cruise. Once we start cruising, the benefits of cruising, um, which attracted millennials and every other generation before, will attract them once again. Uh, it's, this is in no way unique to cruise in, in any way. Well, Arnold, you have some giant ships uh, coming in down the pike five years from now. Are the, have the ships just gotten too big, given what we might see going forward with social distancing uh, and all the crowds on these ships? Are you rethinking how you design these ships? Uh, no, we're not. I, I think the reality is if you think about a large ship, first of all, we, we're building small ships, too. We have ships on the construction that have 200 guests, and we have ships on the construction that carry 6,000 guests. But, but you know, those who have been on cruise know when you're on a large ship or even a smaller ship, uh, it's not like everybody's moving in one big glob all over the ship. That's not how it works. And, and the larger ships actually have more space. And so there's actually opportunity for more natural social distancing on a number of the large ships. But, but in the end, all of this is in this moment. Um, in a f- several weeks' time or a few months' time, there will be an alignment from scientists and medical professionals. What is the best way to mitigate the risk of this particular virus? And whatever that is, we'll be able to deploy it on ships as you can deploy it elsewhere. Wherever, as long as there's social gathering. If there's no social gathering, there's no cruise. But if we're social ga- if, if universities are open and dorm rooms and restaurants are open and airline terminals and subway stations. If those things are open to receiving people, um, then the crews will be able to as well. Uh, lastly, uh, Arnold, bottom line, do you think Carnival survives this? And what does survival look like? What does your company look like coming out the other side? I think clearly initially, um, we're gonna come out operating smaller than we did before we went into this, but that's because there won't be some light switch. Every destination is not gonna open simultaneously. You know, every world market is not going to have instantly the same protocols. That's not going to happen. So it kind of shut down gradually as the virus moved from east to west. And I suspect it will open gradually as different jurisdictions and destinations determine their own um, way forward concerning public health. 
So with that in mind, we'll, we'll do a slow ramp up, fitting in wherever we need to fit in. But eventually, I think the cruise industry will be as robust as ever and be back on, on a road forward um, once society against adapts to COVID-19. And you're still committed to China. Uh, coming into this year, you were supposed to have, I think, 5% of your capacity devoted to China. But given where this started, are you still committed to the Chinese market? Yeah, we're committed to the Chinese market, but honest, yeah, of course, the first place we shut down was China because that's the first place the virus hit. And and when when the virus hit there and and uh, became you know pervasive, we we stopped sailing um, with our ships in China. It's only a small percent of our fleet, but of course we did. But but China is still the largest market in the world um, for everything. It will be the largest market in the world, most likely for cruise at some point in the future. Has the timelines changed for everything? Everywhere in the world, the timeline has changed for everything. But beyond that, eventually, as the world adapts and moves forward, um, China will once again be a robust market opportunity for every industry, I suspect. All right, let's leave it there. Arnold Donald, CEO of Carnival Corporation. Thank you for taking the time. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Take care.